Okay, good morning everyone. It's Peter here once again from AJS and it gives me a great privilege to welcome a doula from a workshop somewhere around Australia and this week we're coming to you from sunny and blustery uh, Tasmania. So it uh, gives me a great pleasure to welcome Jackie Ribbons. Hi Jackie, how are you? Hi Peter, very well, thank you. Good to have you on board and your uh, enormous machine there. Yes. So, yes. Uh, Jackie, you're going to introduce us today to the Quartz family, I believe. That's right, Peter. Yeah, I did a little bit about opals, but I'd, I'd just like to um, to go over the Quartz family, which well, by, by association, opal is a little bit. Um, so the Quartz family is quite a large family, and most people think of clear quartz, but they don't understand that it's a bit bigger than that. Mm, so large, um, they don't understand birth control. Then. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> Family planning didn't come into courts. <laughs> no worries. Yes, so it's a it's a large family. It's it's silicon dioxide basically, um, and all of its offshoots. So most people think of quartz as this stuff. So that's a large quartz crystal. Wow. Um, that's doubly terminated. So we'll get some we'll get some terminology down pat first. So a termination is the point of a crystal, and it's a and it's got a structure. So it's got six sides going to a termination, and sometimes it will double terminate. So it's got a termination at both ends of this one, but normally it's or commonly. It's a single termination. So that's a clear termination there, as in you can see that it's a point. Um, you can you could argue that's a point, but if you can see that it's got no structure going to that point, it's a break. So that is not a termination on this side. That is just where it's broken away in its little bug or its little cave. So it's been sitting on the side of something in the ground like that, and that's come away like that. Um, I've taken these out of the ground in Arkansas and uh, most people will come into the shop and sort of go, oh, look, there's a tiny little chip there. Can you polish that out? I go, hmm, if you knew what this crystal had been through to, to get out of the ground and to be in somebody's hand, it's quite quite a, um, a process. So it's usually... Um, surrounded in a really um, light clay and then that clay's got to be taken off so it's washed in oxalic acid to take all that clay off and then you know it's rumble tumbled from one bit of machinery to another um, when it gets out of the ground onto, the, onto a, a, a ute or a truck or a facility to take it to the vats where there's some oxalic acid. Then it gets out of the vats in, onto mesh tables and then hose down. So to think that it's got a little tiny um, ding in the top somewhere, please forgive it. Um, but that's quite often what we might polish out for somebody. Collectors, no, they, they want it as natural as possible, but some people that are, that are into the healing processes or, or whatever, they might just want that for aesthetics value polished out. So yeah. that's what you might be doing as a polisher. Yeah, that's part of its journey. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. So that's um, what you've got in your hands now. That is yes. enormous. Um, yeah, I've got bigger. Wow. But this is this is a beauty. This when I used to used to teach about this, this was a, one of my favourite to show people because it is, yes, it is a bit, bit big for a pendant. A bit big for a ring. <laughs> Make it into an earring would know where you're going. But yes, it's it's a beauty. Um, How rare is something like that? Say that again? How rare is something like that? Look, to get a double terminated this big um, and, and this quality, it's pretty rare. You know, there will be people out there with bigger, uh, and me included, but it is it's just a beautiful thing. You know, you fall in love with a piece of quartz and you're hooked, really. Um, and where did that come from? This one is from Arkansas. 
And did you dig that up yourself? I didn't. No. Came from a gentleman called Gary Fleck. So, um, terminology, I'd like to just to, to hold that point. So, this I've just described as a crystalline structure, and we can see that nice and clearly. The other, the other guy in in um, the quartz family, or maybe not so obviously to some people, is amethyst. So amethyst is a quartz, a purple quartz. Yeah. You're out to impress this morning, Jackie. Oh, look, we could have had a walk around the shop and then you'd have been <laughs> a bit blown away. The one in the shop is nearly as tall as I am. But this one... Um, so you can see the crystalline structure again. I'm just talking about structure. So you can see that it's got points. You can see how the points are made up. These points then, when they're chipped off or broken off, that's then faceted or cut into gemstones. So that's one that I'm going to show you in a minute. And that's one I've got on the dop stick ready to go. Um, but th these are parts of a crystal. So when it's got a nice crystalline form, it's more likely to go to a collector than it is to a cutter. There is a bit of a balance between cutter or collector, um, and sometimes the two people will fight over, a, over something. But most of us don't want to see a perfect crystal go underneath the cutting wheel. So crystalline structure, we've seen in those two things. Now, a word that a lot of people get mixed up is the word massive. Now, in my world, massive doesn't mean big. Massive means a formation or rather lack of formation. So a good representation of that is rose quartz, again, in the quartz family. So this is the pink rose quartz. It does come in crystals, and I forgot to grab one before this morning, um, but they're very rare and they're very small. When you see the new age sort of double terminated ones that people wear, um this is an amethyst one that's been cut and polished like that it's not a natural formation and so sometimes you'll see a rose quartz one in a double formation it's been cut and polished like that it's not come out of the ground like that a rose quartz crystal is very very expensive and very rare so the largest one i ever owned was about the top of my thumbs worth um and that was worth probably a a lot of money, but maybe well, but it was clear, it was good, it was the best one I've ever seen, and I think I paid about nine hundred dollars for it. So when somebody shows you a twenty dollar double terminated one that they're wearing around the neck, it's been cut, it's been cut out of a massive formation. So these look like something you would eat, a coconut ice, but they're not. <laughs> they're rose quartz, and whether it's this big or whether it's as big as the one I've got in the shop, which is four hundred kilos. It's called a massive formation. It's got no structure, i.e. you can see the structure of that. You can see it's six-sided going to a point. You can't see any structure on this. Are you with me so far, Peter? I am, and I'm sure everyone else is. But I'll invite people as you go along, Jackie, if they've got any questions, please uh, make them in the comments. I'm sure you'll be Not happy Not a problem. To hmm. Yep, easy. So in the quartz family, you've got clear quartz. And clear quartz, um, also, as a point of reference, I will show you something else. A good, a good example of a massive formation in quartz is what I've got on my driveway. So your quartz pebbles that you, you have on the beach or in somebody's driveway or at the sand and gravel merchants, that is still quartz crystal, but it didn't have as much heat and pressure as this guy did. This guy had the ultimate in heat, pressure, pure silicon dioxide. This didn't have as much pressure, didn't have as much heat. So it's just formed as common quartz. And can you cut and polish it? You want to bet you can. So you can still, if you find one of them with your partner on the beach and you want to make something nice out of it for them, yes, you can still polish this exactly the same way as I'm going to polish today. So even that can be polished. You must have the most elegant driveway in your street, Jackie. Every, everybody said, <laughs> the guy with the escalator said, 
blue metal's a lot cheaper. You, why do you want quartz? I said, you will never understand why I want quartz, but I want quartz. And it had to come from all the other, the other side of the island <laughs> to, uh, to get here. So we've got quartz that is crystalline, quartz that is common gravel, which is, again, massive formation. We've done amethyst. When amethyst is left in the ground long enough and it's got a little bit more heat and pressure, it may, if lucky, turn into citrine. So this is citrine. This has been cut and polished. Um, but it comes in the same shape as the amethyst if it's in the little crystals. Mm, so beautiful. this was a piece. This is a lovely piece. This is very gemmy. Um, and this has come out of um, a massive piece, as in massive formation. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lovely piece. That's and, impressive um, with the light going through it. Yeah. yeah, it's just superb. So when amethyst is left in the ground long enough, it will turn into citrine. Unfortunately, some bright spark decided that if we put amethyst in a chamber of heat, then we can get citrine artificially. So when you see citrine that is this kind of colour, and again, this piece is not a natural crystal, it's been cut and polished into that shape. Um, you see that sort of caramelly, dark yeah. um, sort of colour? That's heat-treated amethyst. Mm. So there's your difference. So we wouldn't normally cut or facet this into a gemstone. We'd usually use the better quality of the citrine to, to make a decent gemstone. But they still do use it um, in poorer countries for um, faceting. You can also get lemon quartz. So that's a natural crystal, but it's just a slight lemon to the colour. Hopefully that comes out in the colour of the camera. So yeah. when you've got amethyst that is caught halfway in, in the process, you get ametrine, yeah. which is amethyst and citrine together. Wow. And that's from Bolivia, mainly. Do you know what the difference in years is between amethyst no, and citrine? No. There, amethyst is normally around 19 million to start with. So, you know, you can go upwards from that for your citrine to be formed. Mm. Wow. So, um, and there's another amethyst. This one's an Australian amethyst. It's, um, it's a lovely point. No longer available. That was taken out in the 60s. But it's got a little point, the... the tip of the termination on this one is chipped so that's a classic one for somebody to say please can you polish that because i love it and i just want that repolished so that's something that you might on your wheels do to somebody so we've covered quartz amethyst rose quartz citrine it goes on Ooh. so then you have blue blue quartz very rare oh, light flashes And that's a natural blue included quartz. Well, so it's, it's got the inclusions of the blue through it. So that's just beautiful. A little bit more rare. Your tangerine quartz. We're going into the rare ones now. Tangerine quartz. It's more tangerine than it is citrine. If you can mm. see that little guy. The interesting thing is these things are all formed underground. There's no Correct. colour is ever seen until no. it's dug out of the ground. No, that's right. Yeah. It's just, you know, it, it, it's just a joy. It, it, you know, 35 years behind the counter now and I, I still get blown away. I've got a tiny little smoky quartz. We haven't touched smoky quartz yet, but I've got a tiny little smoky quartz. It's a scepter, so it grew on a stem. It's crystallised at the top. And I was going through a bag of these smoky quartzes one day and, and just this one, and I just thought, there's something about you. And I just pushed it to one side, kept going with my sorting and um, got my, my jeweler's loop, had a look at it. And inside that little tiny smoky quartz was amethyst 
and cacoxonite, which is another mineral again. And it just like, <laughs> you know, how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of crystals have I seen? And something like that, so tiny, but blew my mind and just, you just put back on your heels and you go, I thought I'd seen it all until I saw something like that. It's just, and that's why people get so hooked into collecting minerals and specimens because you just never see the same one twice. I mean, yes, I know I love opals, but, you know, you go through all of the other minerals and, you know, you just get happy. No, this is another great. quartz. This is, so location can change things as well. This is a Herkimer diamond. Um, it's not a diamond at all. It's silicon dioxide still, but it has a black um, carbon material that makes it sparkle more than normal quartz. So they call it Herkimer quartz or Herkimer diamonds. And that is found in Herkimer state of New York um, and location for this name. There are similar quartz that are found in New South Wales, but we don't call them Herkies. So how do you spell that, Herkimer? H-E-R-K E. I've got to write it down, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot. H-E-R-K-I-M-E-R, -E Herkimer. Okay. Now, I've got a question from Leah. Not on the spot. I'm just Leah. dyslexic. Say that uh, again. I've got a question from Leah uh, for you, Jackie. Uh, is tangerine yeah. quartz rare or common? Very rare. Very rare. Ah, oh, there you go. Hang on to it then, uh, Leah. Yep. Yeah. Um, then we get smoky quartz. Smoky quartz is smoky quartz because it's it's um, there's a trick question on this in a minute, Peter. If you look okay. closely, um, smoky quartz is smoky quartz because it's absorbed low level radiation in the ground over millions of years underlying. So smoky quartz should look that like that. It should look smoky. It should look like somebody's just sort of waved a bit of smoke through it from the campfire. Wow. It shouldn't look black and lifeless. It should look smoky. Now, if you look at this one, this one's what we call a phantom. Can you see that pyramid inside it? Yeah. This crystal has not been cut or polished. And that phantom inside there is where it's grown up, stopped, and then more silicon dioxide has started the process again. So there might be 10, 15 more million years between that phantom, its first growth habit, and its continuation of the top. Mm. So that's a collector's piece. But um, my point is you can see that phantom. Now, the sad part of the story, again, like the cooked citrine, is they cook smoky quartz. Um, a very fr good friend of mine walked into a, a room full of it for the first time in the 80s and he didn't make it. Um, he died of cancer three years later. It's um, been somebody's joy to radiate quartz to make smoky quartz because smoky quartz is more valuable than clear quartz. Mm -hmm. So if you radiate right, uh, artificially, and speed up that process, then you're making more money. So know where your smoky quartz comes from. Every single piece in my my place, in my shop, I know where it came from. I know either who took it out of the ground or where it came out of the ground. Um, but I will not accept radiated quartz at all. Now, there's a difference between smoky quartz and a morion. Of course. So a morion is black. That is a, and a lot of people say, no, that's a dark smoky quartz. The, the, the artificially um, radiated smoky quartz looks a little bit more like that. It looks really dark and dense. It hasn't got quite as much luster. Um, luster is, you see the shine on that, the side of that quartz. Yeah. You can also see those lines. See those lines going across there. You can also, that, that is an indication that something hasn't been polished also. Um, and you can often see little pyramids on the termination and things like that. So when you've picked up a quartz and you go, I wonder if that's been cut and polished, if it's got no lines on the side, if it's really, 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 really shiny like that and it's got no other markings, then you kind of 
suspicious that it's all been cut and polished. And these kind of ones have been cut and polished usually out of a massive formation of quartz. So they'll try and make crystals out of that. So there'll be a big lump of clear quartz and then they'll cut and polish little pieces like this out of it. Because it's worth more money, quite frankly. Um, so that's the start of our quartz. And guess what? There's more. There's more. So a lot of people don't understand that tiger's eye. You know tiger's mm -hmm. eye? Yeah. Tiger's eye is in the quartz family. Um, adventurine, which is the silicon dioxide, but it's got a little bit of mica in it. So adventurine, both white, I haven't got a sample, but white, um, green, and blue. They're all in the quartz family as well. But they've got a little bit of a shimmer to them, and that's the mica inside it. And agates, chalcedony. So this is, is here's the word for the day. Oh. Chatoyancy. You know <laughs> what chatoyancy means? <laughs> yeah, tell me. Well, I don't, I'm hoping we'll get, get it on camera, but can you see, oh, all you can see is a reflection in it, can't you? Can you see that that looks like it's almost moving? Oh, really? Yeah. You know that the lines going across tiger's eye, which is, um, and, and it sort of looks like it's rolling. Okay. That's your toy It's a beautiful word and it's a beautiful piece. Yes, it is. This is a, this is a Queensland egg. It's very rare. Um, it, the, sorry. What's rare about it is it's chatoyancy. The actual substance from Agate Creek in Queensland isn't rare. We've got a lot of it. But um, to get a chatoyant piece is very rare. Um, Chalcedony? Jackie, I'm not going to ask you how to yes. spell chatoyant. Um, I, look, as long as I can write it down, I'm right. No, no, um, I don't want to ask you. No, it's all right. C H E T O Y A N C Y. Oh, there you go. And that's a piece of blue chalcedony. Different to agate. Agate is stripy, um, chalcedony is bubbly. Used a lot for um, cameos. Oh, okay. In the early 1900s. And then we have Jasper. Warm Tasmania. This piece, obviously, I've polished and collected, yeah. but um, all the Jaspers um, from all around the world is a common substance, and all the different colours of Jasper, that's all still in the quartz family. Um, I think we've basically covered it. Yeah, I will show you something is... nice, though. Fiona's I'll just show you something up with a question. Yes. Um, she asked about the difference between chatoyancy or parallax. Chatoyancy or parallax? Do you know parallax? Um, I th yes. I think chatoyancy is more of the roll. It's that movement across the fibres. So when you have got the parallel lines, that's what creates it. But um, chatoyancy is the movement over those, that it's created by those parallel lines or the eyesight of movement. Mm. Now, can you go to the other okay. screen, please, Peter? I'll see if I can get this up for you. Look, if we can get this on, on camera, it'll be fantastic, but I'm, I'm just hopeful more than... Now, can you see that star in that? You see the star on the surface? Uh, yeah, I can. Yep, yep. Yep. So sapphire and ruby, you can get star rubies and star sapphires, and that's um, all very good because it's a corundum. Corundum is a different family, the quartz. And um, star, a star or asteration in rose quartz isn't supposed to happen. But it does if it's Madagascar and rose quartz. So that's down the C axis. We turn it around, and there's another one on the exact opposite side. Yeah. That's called star rose quartz. Wow. And the light changes the colour significantly as well. Yes. Yes, it will. So is that a beautiful so orb, is it? 
Yes. Just a ball. Just a bit lower, Jackie. Yep, there yeah. we go. Yep, this is a sphere of rose quartz. Mm, fantastic. Yep. Gee, you'd have fun just playing with that, wouldn't you? Yes. Mm. Marbles was a fun thing once upon a time in my life, but now <laughs> I wouldn't marble. make it. I wouldn't do, the, do it with this. But I was going to show you some agate uh, marbles, which were the marbles that were made before glass for anybody that's really into lapidary. So there you go. There's, there's your um, condensed view of, of um, quartz family. Well, that's great. That's a, a terrific introduction. I'm sure everyone oh. enjoyed that. I've got one. I've got one. Oh, no. And yet there is still this more. Is what I there is still more. Oh, there's onyx and all that, but I won't go into that because too, too much. But this is, you know, one of our famous rocks from Australia. Christopher Rose. Uh, not jade, not jade. Place. Yeah. It is a beautiful place. So what colour would you call that? Apart from green. <laughs> yeah. That looks like sort of uh, Antarctic. The uh, yeah, the white is, is what we'd cut off. We'd slice this and then make the cabochons out of all of that. Mm -hmm. but, um, so yeah, where does that one this, come from? This is the Matrix, Queensland. Okay. You can get it in WA as well, but it's a different shade of green. It's more of a, a darker, um, not as translucent green in, in WA. Now, Jackie, another question from Wayne. What would be a good type of quartz to try to cut for beginners? Um, I would start with something maybe... Well, they're all the same hardness. They're all seven, so it doesn't matter on, on hardness. I did forget another one, Peter. <laughs> Look, can you see that uh, one? I'll yeah. come back to you, Wayne. I haven't forgotten you. Um, that's roof-laden quartz, and that's got strands of titanium and tourmaline. So it's tourmalinated and roof-laden quartz. Wow. Can you shine pretty, your light pretty, through that one? Pretty, pretty beautiful. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, mm. beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So um, look, it doesn't matter where you start, just just have a, have a go at anything. Um, start on a pebble if you've got nothing else and then work your way up. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm presuming that everybody's seen the previous videos. So this is, in case, this is the setup. Um, it goes 80 grit, 180, 220, 600, 1200, 3000, and then polish at the end. Um, the preferred polish for any quartz is tin oxide. Um, if you haven't got any tin, then you can use cerium oxide, but tin oxide is the best for quartz. It gives you a mirror finish. Um, the one that I usually sw swapped for another machine, I've got a 300 grit uh, wheel, um, the other side of these cameras but I will do my best to try and get all of it done in these. With quartz, unlike opal, quartz, if you've seen the previous videos, quartz, you've got to be more methodical in um, your pressure and your speed of turning. So with opal, because it's so soft, we tend to go quite quickly. Uh, we've, we've got a very light touch and... I suggest a light touch with every stone, but it's firmer with quartz than it would be for opal against the wheels. Um, the if you can imagine that you're you're polishing a piece of glass um, because it's the same hardness. In fact, it's getting that uniform cut on every level and being immaculate with it. So you will make sure when you go from 180 to 200 that you are taking all of that 180 grit uh, scratch from it with the 200. And, and, and so it goes up the line. When you get to polish, 
please just don't be too hard on yourself if you polish it and it's not until you get to that polish that you realise that there's a 600 grit um, scratch mark in it. It happens to the best of us. Um, so you just, time and experience will tell you what size scratch something is to go back in that process. If you're unsure what, what the scratch is, then just go backwards, um, making sure that you're cleaning every time, making sure you're cleaning every time you go forward. Um, and uh, and just give it another go. But it, it, it is um, the case that sometimes you don't see that scratch until you get to polish and you go, oh, there's a little scratch on there and you've got to go backwards. Don't beat yourself up out of it um, or on it. So I've got a foot pedal. I don't like touching electrics while I'm working. So I've got a foot pedal for on off. Um, I've got all my um, switches for the water that is above me and um, let's have some fun. I'll do it as a, um, a free form. If I wanted to calibrate it, if I wanted to make it so that it fitted into one of the settings um, that, that you can buy off of the shelf, then I'd mark it out with my templates, for example, and mark that either with a with an aluminium or a brass uh, pen or I'll go for the what I classically use or talked about before the uh, correction marker fluid because you can still see that underneath all the water that we'll be using so let's go Can you hear me okay, Peter? Yeah, fine, Jackie. Yep, lovely. So I'm going to start with 80. So I've just turned the water on. So I've got enough water to keep that wheel nice and, and wet, which does two things. It protects your diamonds that are on the wheel and it will protect your stain, it will keep it cool. Might turn them up a little bit more. So you're not after having, you know, having a shower. You're just trying to keep everything cool here. And I'm going to work all the way across this wheel because, it, because anybody that's got a wheel, you know how expensive they are and we want to look after them. So we work all the way across the face of the wheel. I'm just trying to get an even cut all the way around this amethyst and the amethyst will come up there'll be a where, where you're cutting it will be a different colour to the rest of the amethyst it will go a, a whitish sort of colour or a matte I should say So you try and always, whatever stone it is, and I don't care if it's a pebble off my driveway or if it's a $1,000 amethyst, um, you want to try and get the best out of your stone as you can. So I'll always look at my stone and I'll look at what shape I can get out of that that will give me the most out of that stone. <laughs> So this is going to be a bit of an oval. Try and get your two sides as even as you possibly can. On 80 grit, you're really forming that stone. You're cutting a lot of material quite quickly. And as a professional cutter, nobody pays you to be slow. So now I'm going to start damming the top. Again, using the whole face of this wheel. And I want to, in my mind, see the, 
the, the top of that dome. So I can tell where that the, the top of that dome might be. And that's what I'll cut to. Once I've got that, I'll start going over. Keeping, keeping your movements as fluid as possible, because if you're doing this, you're going to create yourself work and damage. You just want to keep that movement as fluid as you possibly can. And as a jeweler, I want to see that my cabochon comes down to a nice setting level. So I, when I put my bezel or my saw over it, it's a good distance. So all of those things are going through my mind as I'm looking at the stone and working it on the shady bit. And that's my basic form now. So I'm happy with that. For now, I can always come back. But I'll now go over to 180 dip. You can do a 120 wheel if, if, you, if your setup takes it. So again, I'll do around the stone. And then I'll start working my way up. So this top stick is going to go from working there all the way up to there. It's looking like a lolly at this point. It's got that crystalline sort of colour to it. And only working that that distance on your wheels, not going below here, not going above here. And what I've got to do is I've got to be confident that I've taken all of my 80 grit stretches out by the time I finish my 180 wheel. As you might have seen on the previous videos, if, if this was an opal, I'd be there by now. But no, I'm still back here. If it takes a little bit longer, it's just that. A little bit harder to deal with. I'm not gouging in, I'm not being hard, it's just letting the diamonds on that wheel do the work. On to two, 220. Again, let's start with the outside.
I'm starting to see a little bit through the stone now. That sort of matte finish is starting to go and I'm starting to see a little bit more through into that colour. I don't want to lose too much of the stone. And on 220, you're still, you're still shaping, you're not polishing yet. But the scratch marks are getting finer. As I feel it, I can feel little flat spots. So I'm going to try and correct that. Sometimes your fingers pick up better than your eyes. Okay, now I would prefer to go over the 300, but we're going to try and get away with this. So on to 600. It's good to wipe your hands a little bit at that stage as well, just to get any grit that might come over. These are what we call Nova wheels, they're soft, whereas these ones are, uh, are hard wheels. These ones, We'll go a little bit more gently around your edges. So, Now I can start seeing the dropping wax below the amethyst. So we're definitely getting more here. So going back to Wayne's question, if, if I didn't want the criticism of, of being able to see all the way through it, if it was more of a, a solid stone light, um, light and vent terrain, you wouldn't be able to see if there was a scratch going down and in. So it may be a little bit easier to start on something that is a bit more solid in colour. But hey, there's a challenge. So when you get a chance, Jackie, can you give us another yes. close-up? Yes. So what percentage would that be off being fully polished? Um, well, we're at 600 now, so we've got two more stages to go before we start putting it on the polish. And you see how, you know, when it's wet, it looks nice, so you can yeah. start to see what's going on, but it doesn't give you a scratch value. So if you dry it and make it go matte again, then you can see if you, if you especially if you put the loop, your loops on, um, if you've got 
on his flat spot so if you you know accidentally made a bit of an angle somewhere. Looks like a grape. Looks like a lolly, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Oh yes, a grape. So I'll just see if I'm happy with the six hundred. I'll do a little bit more on six hundred with that. Okay. But since I dried it, I saw it was a little bit going on there. I do like to polish the base of, of whatever I'm cutting um, before I drop it. And that also gives you a, a better view to the bottom. Or see your stone, if it's a clear stone, or if it's only just a clear port. Just having a bit of trouble hearing you, I think, Jackie. Ha having trouble? Yeah, it's just the sound was a bit distorted then, I think. Okay, now we're going to go on with 1,200. Speak louder or is it okay? Yeah, just uh, while you're not uh, doing your work, I think if when you're doing your okay. work, it's probably Easier. best not to speak. Yeah. No worries. So on to 1,200. Let's have a look at that one. 1200, you should start to get a shine. Yep, coming along beautifully. Yep. Yeah, you see that little dent that was in there? Uh, where we got there? I got it on the light. A little dent on that ridge somewhere. So I'll, I'll just go on to 1200 again, just a tiny bit, but you come along nicely. At 1200, you're not taking very much off of the stone, so um, longer is better than shorter when it comes to finishing the stone off. That's better. Now 3000.
Where are we? Yeah. That's it. Ooh. So that's after 3,000. Now, the red that you can see there is the wax. So see the colour of the wax? Oh, yeah. Um, what if I try and find my torch again, just for the reasons of the camera? That's the colour of the stone. Whereas when you look at it like that, you might go, oh, why am I cutting a red stone? You're not. You're cutting an amethyst, but it's coming out that colour because of the colour of the wax. Now, unfortunately, my, my machine is set up. So this is cerium oxide, and the other side is tin oxide. Um, but the other side looks just like this. Um, it's a felt pad. I'll turn it off to the mini. It's a felt pad with um, charged, as we call it, with um, the cutting, the polishing compound. And how you do that is you make a little slurry for yourself with a sawn off paintbrush and some tin oxide or some cerium oxide for opals um, on a paintbrush. And then you charge your, I won't put this on here because it's on a brush, but that's the cerium oxide on this brush. And you just literally charge it up with a little bit of a slurry. Um, there's no water going onto this, unlike these that have got water. These just go on dampness. Um, so when when um, when you've got sufficient polishing compound on there, you might only charge it if you're cutting all day. You might only charge it once or twice a day, maybe not even, um, because it does go a long way, and it's you know it's. It's not something that gets better with more. So the slurry so is I'll... damp, is that correct? Yes. So it's, it's you know, it's kind of like consistency yeah. of house paint. And then when you and are doing your polishing, is it dry on the wheel or it doesn't matter? It's damp on the wheel. Usually I'll get a spray bottle and I'll spray, bottle, spray the, the wheel before I start work. Um, and so it's nice and, and damp. I sprayed this earlier this morning. Now I'll put some more charge on there. That's okay. Just stand back a little bit because this one sprays that way. This one sprays that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so there's our amethyst to, to, um, to start with and then we'll make noise. <laughs> I normally wouldn't wet it in there because there might be a little bit of particle from here, but I'm not going to go back to that wheel now. But I'd usually go to the sink and do it, but it would take too long for you guys. And that's her done. Wow. Great um, job. And then that goes into the freezer. That then comes off the, the wax, which is polished underneath. And then... If you take um, a piece of a, a pane of glass, put some wet and dry on the glass, wet and dry paper, sticky tape it to the glass, um, then you can arras your edge going all the way round underneath, um, just so it's easier to set. So when you're pushing your bezel up and over, then you're not you you haven't got a, a sharp edge on the bottom of this stone going to its base. You just take that off ever so gently, um, as in only a third of a millimeter aris all the way around, and that just makes it easier to set. I wish I could push this off to show you, <laughs> but I'll put it on my Instagram. How's that? I'll I'll put it in the freezer and then yeah, thank you. I'll put, and it, I'll put your uh, social details in the uh, Facebook post. 
So people yes, uh, have encouraged you to connect with Jackie there. And uh, Jackie, just while we're on the subject of uh, you and what you do. Um, yes. You're in a little town called Westbury, just half an hour out of Launceston. Yes. And you've got a fantastic setup. You've taken over a bank, in fact. Uh, yes. So you've got a, a shop and a showroom, and you also do right. classes, correct? I do. Yes, we're we're a little bit through the the um, setting up of a bigger workshop for bigger classes, um, but at the moment it's still one on ones. Um, and yes, happy so, days. Um, I had. If if someone and a friend was interested in coming to Tassie for a little fly drive yes. and wanted to incorporate a day or two with you, they'd come just and learn something and um, have some fun. Yes, yeah. do do something beautiful. Yeah, so uh, please think about that next time you're coming to Tassie. Uh, incorporate a day or two with Jackie. Yes. Yeah, Jackie, that was a, a great introduction. So um, thank you so much for that. I'm sure people got it's a It's a big out. topic. It's a big topic and people, you know, some collectors only collect quartz. Some cutters only do quartz. Um, it is, you know, it is a big subject. So mm -hmm. hopefully, um, hopefully something's been learnt today. Now, guess what? Nicola's coming to Tassie in a couple of weeks' time. For a oh, few weeks. lucky thing. So she's going to drop yes, in. Yes, hopefully the board is open. So uh, please do so and make yourself... We'll pop into the shop. The showroom's, the showroom's open to the public um, Friday, Saturday and Sundays if you're in Tassie. Um, the rest of the time I'm teaching or I'm, I'm, I'm on the jewellery workbench or the cutting bench. Um, okay. But Friday, Saturday and Sundays I'm open to the public. Welcome to pop in and... Have a look at the jewellery, have a look at the stones, buy some rough if, you, if you're learning how to cut. Happy days. Oh, hopefully that timing works with yeah. you, Nicola. Uh, thanks yeah. for your comments too, uh, Wayne and uh, Cole and also Gail. So thank you very much. And Jackie, we'll look forward to seeing you again sometime in the future. Lovely. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. guys.